Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. Great to see you. Happy Friday. Happy cocktail night. I've mixed feelings about this light that's shining right on my face because it is hot again. Are you? I, I should not say this to people who are out, you know, Karen, Colorado, like all of that snow, but man, it is warm again. Whew, I almost didn't make it. Terrible traffic jam. What times. Happy Friday. And you know what else? I guess I'm in a bit of a dither, which is, it is not news. Um, you know, <laughs> I feel like the last episode we did, certainly the last cocktail night we did, we were talking about Halloween, all our spooky subjects, and it was a great month, and it was a great way to celebrate that month, I think. Is there something wrong with me? I'm already drinking peppermint um, porter. I mean, it's we have, a, we have a holiday right in between, and there's going to be a lot of fun, lots of things going on, but I must be out of my mind all the same, right? You know what? I might have to kill this light. Let me push it back a hair because I just feel like I'm getting... Tell me if that's really bad. I feel like I'm getting x-rayed. I feel like it's very Halloween-y. You're just going to see bones and teeth right through this, right through this face. All right, let me see who's here. That, we just dropped about 20 degrees. Kirsten, thank you so much. Kirsten always has my back. I was writing from the car. I wasn't writing. I was speaking from the car um, to say I was in a terrible traffic jam and I was afraid I wasn't going to make it. Martha, you are back in Ontario. Good to see you. It is, it is National Button Month. Just so we know, we're on the same page. I'm excited. Doreen, great to see you. I know I didn't answer your email. It's not a big thing in my mind, but I'll answer it so I'll, sooner or later. I'm glad you got this stuff. Linda, great to see you in Massachusetts and Robin in Wisconsin. Your ears must have been burning yesterday. I'm coming to that in a second. Stephanie, great to see you. Sunny from sunny and cool Arizona. <laughs> that can certainly happen. Sharon, great to see you. Happy cocktail night in the rainiest place on the planet, Vancouver, Canada. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a feeling that Amsterdam is a bit rainier. I might be wrong, but I mean, it rained like every day of the year for all of those years that I lived there. I shouldn't say that, should I? That's naughty, but it did. It did. Ryan, great to see you. Happy Friday from Chile, North Texas. Finish another punch piece. For my UFO series, oh, you're kidding, wine and pizza tonight. Oh, I remember, I remember one of your UFO pieces from our last, I think it was our last gallery night, wasn't it? Maybe the one before, because the last one might have been more of a seasonal one. I loved that piece. That was like one of your great works thus far. Um, and so you too, like so signature and special. So good. Karen, great to see you from Chili Black Forest, Colorado. Linda B, cheers, my dears. Happy Friday evening. I'm going to do it too. I don't know why I set myself up for these. Well, I mean, I should have had an extra half hour. It wasn't like I was being uh, reckless or whatever. It was just a bad traffic night. Mm. Bum, you just made a Bloody Mary. That sounds great. Ready for the show. I thought you said ready for the snow. And since you're close to me, I was going to say, uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, hope you're not near the tornadoes in Texas. That's right. Good thinking. Ryan, let us know about that. Eleanor, great to see you. Oh, I'm so glad you're there and happy Friday night. Courtney, great to see you too. I need to get back to you too. I'm already on that project. I'm, I'm good like that today. I've It's been a busy day. Wait till you see the show. The whole day was spent getting the show ready and I'm sure I have more content that we are going to be able to get to tonight. Um, so just so you know, if you didn't tune in on, um, I guess, Wednesday, it was our first episode that was outside of the month of October, and um, we started looking at, I'm going to just do the kind of prologue here, we started looking at the amazing, uh, astonishing work of a woman called Joanne Wood who lives in Connecticut, about an hour from where I am, um, and we will talk about her tonight and look at her work. It is it's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's all good. I didn't want to rush it on Wednesday. I don't want to rush it now. Um, it is just extraordinary, very old school, cutting with scissors, hooking on a homemade frame, um, designing as you go, that kind of work that I think I got a lot of emails after Wednesday's show, people saying, what an inspiration. You know, it's great for beginners coming to the craft of rug making, rug hooking, uh, and for people who have been working uh, within it for decades, it's still a great reminder 
that you don't need all the fancy stuff, right? Or at least you don't need it every time. You can certainly do work of an extraordinary caliber and quality with just your average stuff at home. It is a thrift craft. This episode is really going to bring that home to you. So we have a we have a lot to look at today. I'm so excited. Melanie, great to see you in chilly Mount Vernon, Washington. Gayla, great to see you. Ryan says, all safe on the home front. Bad storms are just missing you. I'm so glad you are lucky. Betty, good to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Great to see you. Chrissy, great to see you too. Happy Friday and cheers, my dears. Oh, Lisa, today's your birthday. Happy birthday to you. Huge happy birthday. Many happy returns. Lots of love. Oh, that is so special that you're here for your birthday. You purchased the cutest rug hooking stocking ornament. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Is it, it's a, is it a finished thing or a pattern that you're going to work? I bet it's a pattern that you're going to work, but that sounds adorable. Happy, huge happy birthday. Here come, here come the waves of happy birthday, right? So nice. Joy, great to see you. Woo, woo. Good to see you. And Dave, good to see you. Priscilla, cheers from beautiful Ohio. Great to see you. Happy Friday night. And April, oh, April, great to see you. I'm just reading the thread as we go. So Dave, your report. Hi, everybody. Beef burger and CC and Coke. CC, sorry, CC and soda. CC and soda. Should I know what CC is? It seems like I should, doesn't it? CC and soda. Come on, help me out. What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? I haven't been a bartender for many decades. That's part of what's wrong with me. Oh, look at all the happy birthdays. Isn't that great? Oh, Susie, great to see you. Pumpkin spice hard cider tonight. That sounds amazing. It was a finished ornament. Too cute to pass up. Well, I know that feeling. Um, oh God, isn't, it, isn't everything too cute to pass up? Ryan, a fellow Scorpio. It's our season. Ryan, you got to tell us when your birthday is too. Um, how exciting. Birthday times. Vicki, great to see you. Happy Friday. Canadian Club. That makes sense. You're good, Mom. You're good. You remember Dad was like such a great um, bartender in, at, at every event. Uh, so I guess we should have that built in as a family. Canadian Club. There we go. CC. Oh, dear. Well, you know, I have to start the episode catching you up on my day yesterday because this is this this is going to be content um, that we're going to be looking at next week. So just to start off with a little bit of a story, um, it's more than a little bit of a story. I have several stories for you. I just don't know if I should bombard you at the beginning of the episode or get some traction going. You're probably shouting outright, get some traction going. But I have to tell you at least at least one thing. Yesterday was an extraordinary day. And let me pull up a photo from yesterday. Maybe you are in our Facebook group, which is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. And if you are, then you saw that I had the great pleasure and privilege of hanging out yesterday with my buddy Kaz, who is in our group. She's always in, she's always there. She's usually online with us, but she's in Montpelier, Vermont right now. She's still there. Um, it's the Hooked in the Mountains rug show. Green, the Green Mountain is, uh, you know, put on the uh, rug show and uh, the guild is there and there's all kinds of vendors and things happening there. And, you know, as, as happens, and I'm, I feel the same way about, about everybody here, we see each other all the time. We see each other all the time, but we never get to meet each other. Or once in a while, we're lucky and we do, but not often enough. And Kaz is in Wisconsin. So I drove up to see her yesterday in Montpelier. Um, I just had to. There was no way I was going to let this opportunity pass. And it wasn't as far as I thought. It was like a three and a half hour ride. And what a beautiful ride. Here's some porn. Here comes the porn. Um, I know you're going to get it there. It, somebody's going to block that. Okay. Sorry, traffic, traffic violations. Um, so it was a wonderful ride up there, beautiful through all the autumn foliage is gone, but just beautiful through the rocks. And I knew that at the end of it, I would be seeing Kaz. Let me show you a photo of us together. Um, gosh, I've got to tell you a couple things that happened. So Kaz and I at the Hooked in the Mountains rug show, um, and this is a Green Mountain event, right? So this was just absolutely incredible. She is just so sweet and so much fun. Honestly, thank you, Karen. It was one of the best days of my life. It really was. Robin Robin gets to see Kaz a lot, fellow Wisconsinites. Um, but for me, it was so exciting. I mean, it was so exciting. It was absolutely wonderful. We had so much fun. And a bunch of things happened. I've got to tell you, I, ah, I was just, I mean, I 
it was such a long day driving back and forth in one day, but I just couldn't sleep last night because a couple things happened that were very big things. One of them was that, do you remember, um, ages ago, must have been over two years ago now, I think it was one of our coffee time episodes in the morning. Um, I was talking about that small book with the spiral binding that was put out by Green Mountain. I'll have to find it, but because I got in the traffic jam, I didn't have time to get set up. It's that small book like this big, like half the size of a printer paper. And the idea was it was a challenge at the Green Mountain Guild. And it was like um, everybody was given a circus wagon. So in other words, like a circus, like a box, like a rectangle with bars on it. I think the subject's a little questionable now, right? This was a while ago. And wheels. So it would be towed, old, you know, vintage style in a string of uh, circus wagons uh, with different animals. And then you would put your own spin on it and decide, do I want an animal in there? Some of them were like more sort of political or um, culturally sort of pop culture relevant statements and ideas and very, very different, all of them. And I remember that we looked at this book. It's a little bit rare to find it, but it's out there if you look for it. Um, I loved it. I really loved it. If it sounds like the world is ending, I guess the people next door are working out at this moment, dropping weights that are like the size of like a mature hippo because um, it's shaking the entire building. Um, I hope that's what it is anyway. So anyway, I went into their little for sale area where they have all kinds of bits and bobs. And out on one of the tables, Kaz spotted it first, were a bunch of the circus rugs, the real thing, and they were for sale. There were nine of them, and oh, it was a great photo. Barbara, great to see you. I hope everybody, let me just pause. I hope everybody who wanted to do that second, Barbara, you made me think of it, designing like the fairy tale storybook because I screwed up the time with the Zoom email. The Zoom email last week was an hour off and not consistent with the time on the website. Sorry about that. So I'm running that class again on Sunday, and that will be 6 to 8. You still have time. It was, for me, the best uh, design light class so far. So you still have a chance to do that this Sunday with me over Zoom if you want to. It's there on Ribbon Candy Hooking, designing like the fairy tale storybook, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So Kaz brought me to this table, and there were nine of those original circus rugs sitting there. And they were $25 each. I don't want you to cry yourself to sleep. They were there, at, and obviously I bought all of them because uh, how can one not? They represented this challenge that was so special um, for the Green Mountain Guild. And I remember when we looked at that book, we loved these images so much. They were the only nine that were there, the only nine that were for sale. Maybe some were sold before, maybe some were never for sale, but I picked up all of them. And I figure we can really look at these together, like, you know, a week from now when some time opens up, I can get them up on the wall. And because there's nine, we can do three, three, three. So I can have them behind me and we can just enjoy them together. It was too good of a thing to pass up. I lost my mind. When I came out of the, thank you, Karen, it was a great class. This is the second part of the news and then I'm starting content. When I came, when I came out with my box of the circus wagon rugs, I'm walking through the area and Kaz and I were going to go put them in the car and get some air because it was about 130 degrees in there or else it was a hot flash. I'm not sure. So we're walking through this area and, and one of the ladies goes who I just met, uh, Diana, Diana, I have to tell you something important. So I went over with this giant box and she said, you'll never guess what just happened. And I said, what? And she said, I just overheard a conversation that you might be interested in. And she said, remember when you ran that episode about Molly Nye Toby, the rug hooker from Barrington, Rhode Island, my hometown. And I said, yes. And she said, remember how you were working on a book project about her? And I said, yes, I remember it well, because I banged my head against the wall for the next two years because I had so much trouble finding rugs. They kind of scattered to the wind when she died in 1986. And I've been in touch with both sides of her family. I've even gone to a family, family funeral recently, but it's very hard to track down these rugs. So she said, I just heard a lady talking and she said that she just bought two Molly and I Toby rugs. And I went, oh my God, who is she? Where is she? Oh, I'm not that sure. She was down there. It seemed like she saw her from behind kind of a thing. She was down in the hooking area. Um, and I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to run down there and just 
be the town crier and just shout it out like I'm nuts. So Kaz and I went down there and I just didn't, I wasn't crazy. I wasn't crazy. It was abrupt. It was necessary. And I said, does anybody know anything? Was anybody just talking about Molly and I, Toby Ruggs? And someone said, oh, I think that was Susan, but she just left. So I said, oh my God, I'm going to, and somebody else in the guild said, I have Susan's phone number. So I called Susan and Susan had indeed just bought two Molly, Ni Molly Nye Toby rugs to flip. And I got in touch with her and she sent me some photos and they are in very bad shape. But the point is they are available. And there's even a third one that she just sold to someone else that I might be able to get also. So these are going to be great fun for us. If, if I do, if I can indeed have them, get them, afford them, all of that stuff, I'll be able to kind of restart that book project that was like a dear, dear and central thing for me. I just kept hitting walls and it became frustrating. It's very exciting. It was very exciting the way that that happened. I mean, I was just, I feel like my heart was still, still, it was just too much. April says, I would have bought the lot of the circus rugs too. I grew up in Peru, Indiana, the amateur circus capital of the world. Is that so, isn't that cool? That is so cool. Have you done a circus rug yet to celebrate that distinction? Because it is a distinction. You know, I remember when I lived in, um, what was it, uh, Mayo Peck, New York, that was right near Carmel, and what's the other town right there? Does anybody know? Because there's another town right there, and they have a different circus distinction, not the amateur capital. Obviously, you've, you've got that there, but it was something else. Maybe it was the birthplace of the American circus, something like that. Interesting, but the subject of circus rugs, it's going to be great for us to dive into. It, I was meant to be there, Karen. It was so exciting. And we had such a happy time looking at the rug show. I took hundreds of pictures of rugs. There were special exhibits by, I think, one of my all-time favorites, Grace Collette, and lots of other people. So that's something that we're going to do next week. Look at the rugs at the Hooked in the Mountain rug show, Hooked in the Mountains, uh, and talk about that time. But God, it was such a great time. I wish we could have all been there together. Um, but by the time we get going with looking at these rugs, it's going to feel like we were all there together, I promise. Somers, that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Barbara. That is fantastic. Absolutely. All right. So let's get going because we have so much content. Uh, I'm sure I had other things to tell you, but I'll just sprinkle them in as they pop into my mind. It just, I, I did say Mayo Peck. Isn't that right? That, I mean, I lived there, but this was about 20 years ago at this point. This was many, many men ago. Um, super nice guy. We had a beautiful house there right near the lake over there. Those are very different days, April says. I put the circus building on my story rug. Oh, of course you did, April. I didn't realize it was you, April, because there's another April that logs on. Of course you put it on there. I forgot about that. Indiana should have tipped me off there. My claim to fame is being a human jump rope. I'm sorry, you're going to have to expand on that because that is, I haven't heard that, I haven't heard that sentence before in my life. It might have been, um, it might have been a first. Did somebody use you as a jump rope? I mean, you look very lithe and your figure is fantastic. So I would, I would believe that. I did. I lived in Mayo Peck. Don't ask me what road I could drive there. Uh, but what, it was like 20 years ago. My mom re might remember. Those are, those are fun days. That's crazy. Something else that we have in common. How funny. We used to go around the corner heading toward, I guess, Carmel. And there was like a beautiful breakfast place across from this huge lake. It might have been Lake Carmel. Maybe that sounds right. Uh, and we used to go there at least once a week and sit outside. It was the cutest place. It might still be there. Uh, it's nice when things don't change, isn't it? All right. My mouth is going to shut. And let's start looking at Joanne's rugs. So... I want to walk into it again for those of you who weren't with us for the Wednesday show. Oh, you're really from there. You graduated from high school there. I lived there for about three years until the relationship fell apart. And that was sad because it was a fun time in a beautiful house, but not the right person. Small world, right? It is a small world. I love it when that happens. <laughs> So let's re let's let's be kind and rewind a little bit because not everybody was here on Wednesday and you know there's a lot of episodes. Let's see where we left off. What we were doing, we definitely saw that. Let me get cute. That's where we left off. Let me just do the backstory for just one minute. <laughs> so I went last week to pick up a couple of rugs from this woman, Joanne Wood. And when I got there, I both picked up the rugs and I realized that I had tapped into this amazing rug hooking world uh, in which Joanne had been hooking for about 65 years and counting and was hooking in a, the style 
I personally love the best. That super folky, hands-on, 1860s, um, thrifty, right? Repurpose, reuse, reinvent, make do, that kind of thing. And, and um, cutting all of her wool that was found wool with scissors, no cutter drawing her designs, which almost all of them out of hundreds of rugs are original designs, drawing them directly onto backing. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. Let me show you some pictures of that right now. Because, oh, Gail, great to see you in Australia. I haven't seen you for a while. I was hoping everything was okay. Good to see you. Let me get rid of this and let me show you her. Let me see if I can find her workspace really quick. And then we'll come back to the chronology. Um, we don't want to miss anything. This is truly good. This is truly good stuff. I feel like this is a really great, um, I don't want to say discovery because that sounds so highfalutin, but you know what I mean. Um, I felt really um, sort of uh, grateful, blessed, proud to have stumbled into Joanne's world. I'm just flashing through some stuff here because I want to get to, nope, wait a minute, spoiler alerts. If you don't like spoiler alerts, close your eyes for just a second. Gosh, a lot of spoiler alerts happening. I'm sorry. Hang on. No, wait a minute. Okay, I was going to say we must be getting warm at this point. Let me make sure we got the first. All right, here we go. So this is what Joanne was sitting working on at this moment. And hey, this was a week ago, so she's probably three rugs ahead at this point. Uh, she is like a crazy little firefly. But she has this homemade frame that somebody, oh, what did Ryan say? I love that Joanne and I design the same way. I do too. I do too. Drawing onto backing making it up as you go. That is so, you are like kindred spirits in the way that you design. And you know what? If you're saying, I wish I could do that, you can do that. This is the way she works. So she she works on a homemade frame. We talked about this in Wednesday's episode, so I'm not going to hit that too hard. You can see that she, she always works on burlap and she does not want to work on anything else. She uses nails and nails in the burlap around the frame. And sometimes she adjusts it, you know, or obviously when she moves it, she adjusts it. She works area to area. You can see, and you know how we always say, myself included, that when I'm working on a backing fabric, I always use a black Sharpie, and particularly like an industrial Sharpie, which used to be called the rubber dubs uh, Not anymore, just industrial, just because I'm worried about it bleeding. But you know what? I'm going to take that theory and put it in my pipe or something where the sun don't shine because Joanne has been working this way for a very long time and there has been no problem. She has got Sharpies of every color and that is her way of color coding and color planning what is to come. So while I'm not going to say that um, colors, you know, different color Sharpies don't bleed, it is entirely possible but that they bleed, but it is completely up to you at the same time whether, hey, Cats Gallery, whether it's okay for you, right? Because if, if it, okay, a little bit of it rubs off on your hand or on your material, I'm telling you, looking at her rugs in great detail as I did, there is no problem. So this is another way that you could work. Um, she just has tons of Sharpie colors and she just gets right in there. She works it out as she goes. You can see she's even designing, let me back up again. You can even see she's designing her border kind of as she goes. She's got the shape in there, but she's she's just drawing it um, and adding to it in a very spontaneous manner. And you can see how she, I mean, to me, these are the most beautiful pictures I think I've ever seen, other than obviously the ones of my children, because I am looking at someone's working process, right? I am looking at the way her brain works and, and all of these little lines and all of this reshaping, look how she resized a house. Look how she kind of sketched in some sort of um, brackish type, you know, trees, skeletal type trees, um, and all of the kind of layers of colors that she's got in there. This tells you everything that you need to know about what is going to happen next. You can see that she was plugging in a color that she wanted to be green and she pulled it out. It might have been that she was plugging in too much orange and she thought, nope strayed too far from the plan and she pulled a little bit of it out who cares right just hit, hit it hit it again with the right color and see if it's any better if not pull it out again and who cares but it is such a gift to be able to look at the way that someone works to be privy to the process the technique of another artist man that is priceless so one more close-up of the way she's working now 
I'll be so curious. I hope to see her in the very near future. Uh, Karen says nails are much easier for backing than gripper strips. Well, you know, the punchline is that she has gripper strips on this frame and she doesn't, she just doesn't even use them. Like she just ignores them. Somebody who, I guess, whoever made the frame put them on there for her and she just, she could, she could care less for them. She does not care for them. So she just hammers in the nails, you know, avoiding the gripper strips. She doesn't even think about it. So interesting that you say that, Karen, because now we're getting a window into the way that you work too. Sharon says the brown looks like a vegetable garden. You know, you're right. I wonder if that's partly because the orange looks like some little carrots or something, but you're right. It looks like very rich soil in the way that it's um, situated right next to the house. It looks super rich, doesn't it? Mm. Honestly, I could look at this picture all day just because I keep seeing different things and I'm just so, I'm so excited. Oh, that was this nice one. This is, let me pull back here just in case you didn't see Wednesday. Sorry to keep flashing you. Um, this great piece, hang on, I'm getting there. I put a bunch of her work onto the Ribbon Candy Hooking website. You'll see there is a tab for it now, the Joanne Wood tab. You will see that quite a number of rugs will appear there over the weekend. There are already quite a number there. I have them on um, whichever backing you choose as a pattern. But um, this one is one that comes also as a kit, either just the house kitted or the entire piece if you like the text. Welcome to the Woolbits house. I thought, God, this is amazing. Little birdhouse on the right. I mean, her pieces are very folky and naive in their look, and they are great for beginners. I think, wait a minute, I don't want to do. Welcome to the Woolbits house. Okay, so I think actually this is where we left off. Tell me if I'm wrong. I easily could be. It's not the first time. Uh, love that picture. Would love to meet her. April, she is so wonderful. She is such a wonderful person. You know, she seems like um, the kind of a stoic person, but I immediately got to feel that she's super warm. I was able to like hold her hand and do that. I like, I like to do the handy pandies when I meet someone. And um, she seemed to like that too. She seems like such, just such a warm person. And then when I learned about how uh, religious she was and how she hosted all these meetings at her house. And while I was there, she was very um, worried about um, having people over later and realizing that someone was coming who had a, um, if not a wheelchair situation, some kind of a disability. And she was trying, she was worried about setting up the table in such a way that when that person arrived for the first time at their Bible studies group, that they would have the spot right at the edge of the table so they didn't have to travel any further across the room that they could just sit down. She's just so thoughtful and such a sweetheart, you know. And the fact that, I'm going to choke myself up, the fact that all of these um, rugs come out of her stories and her life story, um, that's the part that I really love. I love how she does them. I love how she thinks. And I love being able to go rug for rug and look at her stories. What's better than that? There's nothing better than that. So let's come back over here. Now, um, there will be a lot of rugs with a sort of religious feel to them. So hopefully that is, is okay for everybody. It's definitely okay for me. She does a lot of interfaith rugs too. So, oh, Melanie says, I use a lot of clip art and stencils, as you should, right? That is a super smart thing. I think she does too. When you look at this piece, right? So she's using Let Us Adore Him. And remember from Wednesday that April and I, the neighbor, were under the bed, like pulling rugs out and unrolling them on top of the bed. So here we have the most delicious layer cake of lots of different rugs. So just look at the Let Us Adore Him here with the black border. This is obviously a Christmas rug. Uh, this is a nativity scene with a creche. It is absolutely beautiful, kind of a um, original setting, kind of a de desert setting. Uh, just a beautiful rug. It has that old time 1950s Christmas feel about the edge with the poinsettias and the um, holly berries and leaves. It's got that beautiful text, uh, but in the center, it's a great landscape, very colorful, very evocative and emotional, really beautiful. Can you see in the distance? Let me see if I pulled closer here. I pulled closer a couple of times. So you can see, and remember, she works with what she has. She marries her wool in the crock pot um, throwing in all kinds of different pieces, collars, cuffs, uh, whatever she's got. And she tries to marry colors together so that she can shift, lift and shift color to get same colors. So it's great to see you in rainy Kansas. I love those leaves and that little turkey. 
she she works with what she has, right? And knowing that, you have to give extra respect and kudos because there's a lot of color here. Um, this must be hard. I mean, she's a great collector of bits and pieces, as you must be when you work in this manner. Uh, another beautiful uh, sort of corner edge to it, and see in the distance how she's got what look like, this might be a stupid thing to say, but they look like hay bales to me. Um, the sort of square, almost, almost invisible looking uh, blocky things. That wasn't really smart, was it? Um, really, really pretty. Look at the sky, the way that it shifts. It is all so pretty. She's got a lot of, oh, this is the side of the creation. You can see that she has a patterned material going right up through the top. I mean, just come back here for a second and think about this in terms of composition. What a great idea. Just and, and don't be confused by that diamond border on the right. That is a rug underneath it. So this rug stops at the mistletoe and the poinsettias and the let us adore him. So we've got the nativity scene with the wise men, with the animals. Uh, we have got a very bare, cr more like a crèche scene than a stable, uh, which I think is really cool. It has this bit of an architectural feel. And I love how she blasts through the center of the composition with the North Star. Uh, it looks so magical, right? And you can see in the sky there are more little dit dots, like stars in the sky. Uh, just beautiful. It's just beautiful. But you see how she naturally, because she is not trained and she was not trained to rug hook. Do you see how at the bottom left she has that dark brown, almost like shadow there? And at the top right she has the dark blue. So while there is a lot of interest in the foreground, this is a storytelling rug and we're looking at what the story is. Whether you feel religious, are religious or not, what a beautiful story about a baby being born and new hope brought into the world. She has got the whole story laid out for us and she has got the colors balanced perfectly. Bottom left, top right. And then she's got a cluster of little palm trees on the right middle and then higher up on the left. Those are balancing each other too. She's doing, for someone who is not trained, she's doing some extraordinarily clever things with composition. Let me see if there's any more bits and pieces. Oh, I just wanted to show you, and this is not a fantastic photo. My hands were like shaking. I was so overexcited and I was taking forever to get all these photos and I kept, I was trying to be present with the conversation, but I kept having this feeling like, Whew, I was thinking about writing an article for Rug Cooking Magazine and now I think it's turned into a book and oh my God, how am I gonna how am I gonna capture all this? And I was getting myself all, you know, flustered and I wasn't taking the best photos. But what I was trying to show you here was that in that sort of blaze, um, that almost looks like a not to be sacrilegious, but tree topper coming down into the crèche, coming down into the stable, this wool, at least one of the wools, is actually yarn, like a chenille yarn with sparkles in it. You know how you get those novelty yarns and you often see them at, you know, the dollar store and those kinds of stores? They're not expensive, but they often, they're acrylic and synthetic and you do not want to block them with your iron because they are synthetics. But they always, you know, have beautiful sort of sparkles and things happening. This is what she used. She hooks it up and then she can add yarn here and there because those kinds of yarns don't have a lot of body. Right, so you can always add them in later. Just don't hook too tight and then you can always add them in later. So she's got some beautiful glitter yarn going right up through the center. I mean, it really is, um, it reminds me of every Christmas song I've ever heard, um, almost. So hold on just a second, let me find, find my way back here. I need the North Star to find my way back here. So here comes another one that, this is a life changer. Oh, Melanie says her camels really look like camels, not horses with skinny necks. Um, let me look at them again. It is hard to do animals, isn't it? It's, it's definitely hard to do camels because they're a bit unexpected. Absolutely. You know, you're right. The, the hump on the back looks right. The big eye looks right. And this camel, the one I'm looking, you know, at like kind of up at the top, he's turned a little bit, like a little bit toward us. That's really hard to do. Remember her color situation is she doesn't have all the colors that she wants and needs. So she's trying to make it work and she's making some really good decisions about where to put colors and where to let the colors shift because of lack of. Um, it's an extraordinary piece. Now, here comes the one that really, oops, sorry about that. This is a life changer for me right here. This one got me. This one really got me. Let me take a quick swig before it happens again. Dave says, I use a staple gun onto a wooden frame or upholstery tax, cheap and easy. Absolutely. That's, that's perfect, Dave. I'm glad that you said that. You know, you don't need, if you are a beginner or anybody, 
you don't need to have those carpet um, strips. Yes, they hold the backing material so well and taut, tighter than a drum, but it, it is not necessary, right? Don't say to yourself, I'm not gonna start this craft because I don't have I, I don't have the money at this moment for all of these expensive supplies and frames and tools and cutters. That's an excuse. You can do this, like Dave's saying, with upholstery tax or a staple gun, scissors, and cut up material, an old picture frame that you're just like stapling onto or nailing onto. That's the way that they used to do it and it still works today. It is so nice to have nice things, but you don't need the nice things. And your piece isn't going to be any less nice if you haven't used the expensive things. That's not a thing. That's not a thing at all. So don't don't use that as an excuse and don't talk yourself out of getting started. Um, this piece is extraordinary. So she said to me, um, she put it, she unrolled it and put it on the bed and she said, what do you think this is? And I thought, Whew, I don't want to get this wrong and I want I don't want to be stupid right because I was really enjoying myself and I wanted to say something that sounded a little bit normal so I said well super abstract but to me it looks like a god's eye view looking down from the heavens down at the ground she said that's exactly what it is and I said oh god thank god um this is a view of remembered from years and years and years ago this is a God's eye view of Cranberry Lake in upstate New York. Now, if you took the Designing Like Chagall class with me, you'll remember that Cranberry Lake is where Chagall and his wife had to flee to when they were forced to leave Europe for a second time during the Second World War. And unfortunately, this is where um, his wife died on Cranberry Lake and it changed the course of his life and it was uh, profoundly sad and unexpected. I missed something, Ryan. Yes, Dave, I recently did that for the first time on a large old picture frame. Did Prodi with it and it worked out perfectly. Excellent news indeed. That is fantastic. Isn't it great? Aren't they, isn't it great to be together? I mean, it really is. I have to say, another detour, but I really thought that when I started this, because it was that COVID time, that it was just going to be like some kind of a bandage on an axe wound while we were all miserable. And it's turned into such a thing, hasn't it? Just love the way that we share and communicate. I really look forward to these to these nights so much. Good time to say thank you for everybody who supports me on Patreon. I sent out a Patreon uh, message today, and I'm going to start sending them out at most every two weeks apart. Sending it every month trips me up, and I tend to forget, and then I have too much to say, and I feel frustrated that I can't get it all out because time is always a thing. I'm going to start sending out Patreons more often. If you already subscribe to Patreon, you will see a lot more free patterns and a lot more news from me on a regular basis. And if you don't, it's a good time to jump on board. Karen says, what is your opinion of using a rug glue on the back of a piece before you put on the backing, particularly if you're putting the rug on the floor? Um, thank you, Suze. Thumbs up. Always good and helpful. My opinion, Sharon, is I'm sh not a very shared op opinion. I don't, but it doesn't bother me at all. I feel like I have a pretty good working knowledge from like years of art school of all kinds of um, archive quality glues. And, and at this point, the glues are quite good. I don't think that it's necessary, but I know particularly people who do tufting or combine rug hooking or punching or other forms with tufting, it is often very helpful and quick to be able to glue the back. I don't think it's a big deal at all. It is one again one of these things that as Americans with you know within our sort of uh, wrinkle in time rug hooking moment, we tend to say don't do it. It's a bad idea. I don't think technically it's a bad idea. I don't think there's going to be repercussions. Just make sure that the quality of what you are using is okay for textiles. Um, don't don't you know use something that's accidentally like for glass or for a different material altogether. But I trust, I trust the products. I just don't feel that it's particularly necessary. But if you're, if you're finding that there's a need for it or it makes you feel better to use it, my opinion is I trust the products that are available. 20 years ago, I'd say, ah, I almost said a bad word. Oh, no. But at this point, yeah, I mean, all of this stuff is archival and it's meant to last forever, so... Mission Creek Farm, you got your stretch bar order from Blick today. Fantastic. I love Dick Blick. Enough to make three frames. 
fantastic. That is so great, isn't it? The stretcher bar frames. Now you put them together like dovetail, right? And then you're going to staple them together like that. And then you're going to staple or tack your backing fabric over the edges there. This is a great thing to do. And this is also a great way to display your finished work by getting these stretcher frames in a set size. You can get any size from Dick Blick, any size. And then you just make it custom to fit the piece that you did, right? We should talk more in a different episode about finishing and backing, not so much backing, but finishing and edging things, particularly the things that are on three-dimensional frames, because you can do this with the shadow box frames that are quite deep. And then you have the problem of, well, what do you do on the side? Because you see like an inch or two or more of the side. There's all kinds of things that people do now. It's like the world is your erster, right? I did that on purpose. Paula, great to see you. Sunny and windy Southern California. Oh, I'm so glad, Suze. I'm going to put another one out soon. I tend to get, um, I just trip myself up because I haven't written for a while. And then I feel like I have so much to say. And I go, oh my gosh, I'm so short for time. How am I going to get this done? I just have to do it more often. Just as simple as that. I've had enough people ask me how to hook without a frame. Maybe I should do a short video. Absolutely, Karen. Absolutely. You don't have to hook with a frame. I mean, I think about Claire Murray wrapping. I have to, still have to visit her. Can you believe that? She went on vacation when I was a free and then I was on vacation and she was free and uh, we've been playing a crazy game, but she has always hooked just wrapping. It has to be a larger rug, wrapping the backing fabric around her lap. And she says her neck does not hurt from doing that. Mine would, I already know that, my neck and my back, but hers does not and it still does not. And she still works that way. Interesting, there's so many ways to do it. Karen, you absolutely should. Please do and put it on our page. Chrissy, I love getting the monthly page. Oh, thank you, Chrissy. I love thinking about you reading it. Oh, all right, let me come back here. So God's eye view, cranberry lake. So we're standing there on the edge of the bed and she is saying to me, Joanne, she is saying over on the right, uh, you know, where the blue starts over on the right, she's going, this is where we would take our little rowboat and we would come rowing down here and we would stop at this top edge of this island underneath and we'd have a little picnic or we'd get back in the boat and then we'd row over here this way. And she's pointing as she goes to the different spots on the map. She knew exactly where the family used to stop. She knew exactly what point you were supposed to turn around at because it was just too far. Isn't it interesting? I mean, isn't it like, it's just so, it, it's so emotional for me. It's like heartbreaking. Just the memory and this map and she's doing it from her memory, little like pathways. And she was going, oh, yep. And we sometimes stopped here. And this, if we went here, it was too far. So we would have to turn around because it made just too much rowing and too long of a day. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I will in a second. Let me just come back and then we'll. But anyway, I just thought, what a great idea. We have talked about God's eye views, and we have talked about city streets and uh, Google Maps helping you, you know, um, chart the, the bones of a project that is a map-driven project. Uh, but I don't think Joanne looked at this stuff. I think she just had this idea, these memories from many years ago on Cranberry Lake, um, and all of those little details built into it. And I thought, oh, this is so beautiful, isn't it? It's just so beautiful. So I think we saw this one, but I'll, I'll show it just quickly one more time. This was a funny one. Uh, and this is her most recent rug, uh, other than the one that's currently on her frame. Martha says, I love my wooden hoop. Doesn't pull out the loops and you can easily change. I love them too, uh, to another section of the rug. Martha, I also love my hoops. I have regular hoops that I lean up against tables and the arms of the couch. Um, and I also have the hoops with a lap for base, right? So it's like a stepped loop bottom that goes on your lap and then there's some space where your hand can sneak under uh double yeah at melanie that's like a double loop both of them work double loop is better and you know one of the the double hoop is better because it has that step underneath that rests on your lap so that when you put your sort of blind hand under with a wool strip there's a space for it in between the lap and the hoop um gosh what was i just going to say you know what i figured out with those stepped or the double hoops, the lap hoops, they often fit in hat boxes. So for example, I went to an antique store and I found this hat box probably from the 1960s, had kind of a quilted top, very dated, but it had a clear body on it, kind of like, um, um, I'm trying to think of what we call PVC in the U.S., I think that's a British term, PVC, it's like that thick plastic, you know what I mean? You sometimes put it over a picnic table or a dining table. But it was kind of made of that, but very uh, rigid. And my double frame fits right in there. 
not with a ton of work on it. There's not that much extra room, but it fits right in there. So for travel, it was perfect. I stuffed it in there and in between, I put the, all my other worms and all the other things I needed and just carried it like a hat box. That worked great. So that was a nice, um, that was a nice thing about traveling with that particular kind of a frame. Um, it worked really well inside a hat box. Ryan says, to all, any advice on making a larger piece than your frame with gripper teeth? Don't want to be limited in size, but it seems the teeth would tear out your work once you move it over. Um, I'm going to look for all kinds of opinions on this. The official opinion on this, Ryan, is certainly if you're careful and you pull down and away from the teeth, because the teeth are directional. You can see the directional that they're holding it in. If you pull down and away, the official the official verdict is it should not pull it will not pull your loops out. My feeling being one of like the lost stooges, you know, the fourth stooge, always Teddy calling me on this night, um, is that no matter how careful I am, I, I always pull some stuff out. So I always have the same problem. And for that reason, um, I work on the larger frames or some people wrap with sort of this, the heavyweight cellophane around the edges. That can be tricky too, because then you lose the traction where it's covered. I'm looking also for other people to comment on this. Um, I have used avoidance of the situation to be able to work fast and not risk a lot of loops coming out. I do believe that if you're very careful, you can avoid having your loops come out. I think it also depends on your materials because I often, when I'm, when I'm punching, it's a big thing, right? Because the loops are actually on the teeth. I often use um, more unrefined wool, like a little bit of roving or the curls or something that is way more likely, if not to get pulled out, to get roughed up. And when it gets roughed up, it looks different. So then I have to be really thoughtful about the order that I'm hooking things in because I'd never want like unrefined wools, big, thick, fat wools to meet those teeth because if it doesn't get pulled out, it'll get roughed up and I'm not happy either way. So I'm looking for, Teddy does love his mama. He, he forget, it's like one night a week that I'm not there and he just, he forgets. Melanie says, I make larger pieces than my gripper frame and if it pulls a few loops out, I just fix them at the end. Melanie, that's that's great common sense advice. It is. It's like, you know, you hope for the best. You get what you get and you don't get upset. And then whatever gets a little bit, whatever, you fix it. That's, that's one of the great things about our craft is it's so possible to fix stuff after the fact. It's not knitting, is it? Where it's very, very tricky to get back into the body of something because you screwed something up way back when. Uh, that, that is a heartbreaking story. But for us, we can just pull a few loops out and be back where we meant to be. Uh, rewind the clock that way, right? So we looked at this one a little bit. This is her most recent one uh, off the frame. And this is this is definitely on ribbon candy hooking. I put this, oops, I put this up there. I think I called this city sidewalks because I felt because of the, and I said this on Wednesday, you see that green building in the middle, that little lamp there? She said, what does that remind you of, that little lamp? Can you tell what that is? Um, oh, shoot, I cut it off in this picture. I said, it reminds me of the, oh, these are little clips from City Sidewalks. Here it is. I said, it reminds me, honestly, of the of the leg lamp in Christmas Story. And she said, that's what it is. It's the, it's the leg lamp. You know what? I forgot. I changed the name on Ribbon Candy Hooking from City Sidewalks to... Um, leg lamp avenue I thought that would be easier to remember so this design is there drawn um, as leg lamp avenue and you know I am gonna hook this I have no doubt that I'm gonna hook this 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 winter and when I do I'm gonna put all kinds of little flakes in the sky I'm gonna give it more of a night time look and I'm gonna have snow coming down in front of the buildings I'll probably do less colors um, Joanne is way way more colorful than even I am but I thought ah I really like the idea of it. I like the joke of the lamp in the window. I'm definitely going to be working on this. Martha says, since I hook, since I hook in four cut and do smaller detailed rugs, I find the hoop is the easiest. You are so right, Deanna Roving, especially the fibers that are fragile and wouldn't stand up to the gripper teeth. It's just such a worry. You know, it really is. I mean, not in the grand scheme of things, obviously, but, you know, on your hoop, it is a, it is a great worry. Good. Good advice. So listen, remember that when I was there, um, there were lots of rugs on the walls. There were some rugs out of the way of traffic on the floor and um, many more rugs. 
that were not there anymore because um, they had recently taken up rugs and put them out of the way of traffic so they weren't trippers. So many of the rugs that I looked at, and when I say many, I mean in the hundreds, were inside like photo albums that jo Joanne and I were looking at. There, was, there were many albums and they all had many pages and many photos. So in some cases, at this point, looking at these albums together, I was like, um, yeah, I'm not gonna start taking pictures out of sleeves. Um, in many cases, the rugs have been gifted and are long gone. Um, I thought, you know, this, this is a much bigger project than I thought. I'm just gonna take a few pictures through the sleeves in some cases, and then I'm, I'm gonna go back with really good equipment to be able to scan and get the highest quality version of these rugs that are not there anymore. So there were some that even though the quality of me taking the photo through the sleeve is not fantastic, come on, this is just such a great rug. What a great farmscape. This reminds me of kind of a Waisaki, you know, the artist Charles Waisaki. Maybe she was inspired by that. This is a great, April, this reminds me of your rug too, your, your story rug, your like life story rug. I love the different layers of interest. I love the different buildings, the organic, uh, organic farm stand, the little animals in the field, the little guy with the cart, the different colors of trees, the hillsides made of patchwork that look like they're combed, raked with color, the mill building right, with its wheel turning. There's some kind of a little schoolhouse on the top left, the waterfall coming down through the mill. This border made up of these different colors of pumpkins arranged in groupings. It does go all the way around. I did an awful crop with this photo, but it does go all the way around. You see the little covered bridge where the, um, the road is going right through it to a pumpkin patch set in the back. And the hot air balloons up in the sky with a kite. I mean, isn't this charming? Do you see on the right, the hillside with the two kind of Van Gogh haystacks and this little collection of five sheep? They look like pips on a die or a dice. And one of them is black inside this fenced in little area. I mean, isn't this just amazing? I just love this piece. I'm having a little sip, hang on. It really got me. I mean, I was just, um, you know, there are so many artists besides Charles Waisaki who work in this folk style, try to capture the slice of Americana um, that is so special, so um, unique, right, to its place. And it, it, I just love this kind of work. So this is one, and this is one of the many that you will see pop up on Ribbon Candy Hooking over the weekend. There's probably five or six on there now, maybe, maybe more. Um, that was one of the things I was working on today, and I considered that part of getting the show ready, but because of the traffic jam and arriving late, I don't have slides of the drawings I did of all of them. And I'm not tooting my own horn, but I did great drawings of all of them with just enough lines to get you exactly the information that you need to go into a project like this that at first sight seems kind of uh, busy. Absolutely workable for beginners uh, and seasoned hookers alike. Oh, PD, good evening in Georgia. Great to see you. This is an even worse photo. I'm so sorry. Joanne's pointing to something here, but this is another vertical orientation kind of a photo, a portrait uh, orientation um, of an immediate place in the neighborhood. And you can see she's pointing out to me the different buildings and the different road that runs through. Um, this is a local spot, local to where she is. And she's showing me the different houses. You see how at the bottom she's got that dark background. You cannot read into... Um, these compositions, whether it is nighttime, daytime, spring, summer, you cannot because you have got to remind yourself that she is working with limited supplies of colors. And she has got a very dark bottom that looks like it might be a nighttime bottom, but it might not be nighttime. It's just what she had and she's using it. It might be nighttime now that I'm looking again because you see the lights on in the windows. Maybe it is nighttime. It's just lighter, maybe lighter on top because the moon is closer to the moon, right? Uh, could be like an altitude thing, but it's just exquisite. I love the idea. Look at all of the levels in this composition, right? Look at the little trees outlined in green, unexpected, army green, dark, 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 evergreen, cobalt blue. Look at them running up the center of the composition like a spine. And then the way that the houses are placed on the different side, according to the way that she thinks of them as being there, actually set out on the ground. She has, she's using kind of a um, classical Persian 
uh, composition in that she's using height to relay distance, right? If you think about what Persian art looks like or uh, any kind of Indian art, th they do this trick of having long, skinny paintings, pieces, and using height as distance. So the higher up you go, the further out uh, the thing is. And that is understood. It's understood in Eastern art and Western art. I just thought this was a great uh, composition. And, and I will get better pictures of everything, but it made me think, imagine a corner of your neighborhood or street looking at uh, what's there in this way, bracketing off different areas, partitioning off different yards, uh, placing buildings, dropping them down. You can see the buildings in the front, particularly the house on the right. She's, she's got a partial God's eye right there looking down at the roof. It's not consistent. It doesn't have to be consistent. This is folk art. So many of her, oops, okay, there we go. Um, pieces, this is, this is another one that she had a picture of. Somehow the glare wasn't so bad on this. This was a piano uh, bench cover for a friend. Uh, not a long skinny one, but you know, more of a golden rectangle kind of a thing. Um, this, is, this is one that is definitely in the ribbon candy hooking store. I got this one, I got this one done today. Absolutely love this. Absolutely love this. Remember that these rugs are available under Joanne Wood. Um, I would love to see us working on a whole bunch of these, partly because I think this is just unbelievably uh, meaningful tapping into this many years of rug hooking history with, within the work of one person. But I'm also um, having this scarcity mode feeling that, oh my God, so many of these rugs are gone. Um, I have this, yeah, this, this, this weird feeling that I really want to, to hook up a bunch of these, um, some in different colors, some in the original colors, because they're gone. Um, and that makes me feel antsy and nervous a little bit. It shouldn't, right? It's just the nature of, of things. Um, but I would love to see some of these hooked up with either different colors or uh, recreating the same colors because I think her color palette is exquisite, unexpected. I just love, this is a great scatter rug. You say scatter, a quilters say this a lot with like the different kinds of materials. It's a scatter print because you just, it's like you had a bunch of wildflowers and you just dropped them and they landed where they landed. And it makes for a great composition. A little bit of Monet, a little bit of an English wildflower garden, um, and a lot of Joanne. Really beautiful opportunity to plug in lots of colors. This is another one that I photographed through a sleeve another portrait orientation so it's tall and skinny i love this snow scene she is doing something that we know that the great canadian iconic artist maude lewis loves to do and that is to use the color blue as a shadow on the snow so she's using a little bit of gray too but there are large spots of blue who knows why? You know, I think I mentioned the name Maude Lewis, and I don't think that she was aware of Maude as an artist. So it's not like it was a learned or studied thing. It was just two people having the same great idea. Using blue as a shadow color on snow is a real specific, because it can look like water, but it really, really feels right to me. I love the look of it. I love the look of it. And with this pretty blue sky on the top, Again, there's some great composition stuff happening here. And again, she's not trained. So we've got a character in the foreground down at the bottom of the story. And we probably should be reading the story from the bottom up. So we're looking down there. It looks like, what is it, like a sled or maybe a snowblower, something like that? Something like that. Um, and then we see, I think, the greatest compositional element in this particular piece, that round sweep, like the letter C, going around that red building. That is going to unite uh, that whole bottom third of the composition, right? Because otherwise it'd be a lot of blank space. You could put in more trees, but doesn't this work better than just more trees? This makes a lot of sense to me. That round sweep really softens the composition. And with all of these very boxy houses, that curve is so welcome, isn't it? It softens things right up. It's just a beautiful, um, beautiful idea. V very good instinct. And then our eye travels up and you're seeing all these boxy houses. Look at the wacky colors of windows she's got going. 
like the pink window with the cranberry colored, um, the, pink, the pink house with the cranberry windows, the blue house with the gray windows. My favorite, the church with all of these colorful windows. She's not doing stained glass within each window. She's doing just all color windows. I mean, isn't it something? And then if you look up to the right, she's got that kind of paprika little house with the blue roof and kind of greenish gray windows. She just does what she does and it all works. And sometimes I think when we are working on a piece and you, you think to yourself, huh, um, I'm worried about uh, contrast. I'm worried about uh, color planning. I'm worried it's becoming too busy. I've got lots of like what Stephen Sondheim, the great musical theater writer, would call for, for winter trees, broken umbrellas. It's got lots of broken umbrellas. Um, is it gonna to become too busy? Is it gonna become a mess? Melanie says, my favorite mod, Lewis, is snow scene with covered bridge. Um, I don't know exactly which one that is, but I love her covered bridge paintings and I bet I've seen it, I bet I've loved it. I bet everybody who's seen it has loved it. She is just a one of a kind. So there's a lot going on here. It gives you food for thought, doesn't it? And even where there are groupings of trees, like on the top left, there is still a house hiding behind that grouping. It gives you a feeling of community, right? This is not a stark winter scene. Winter scenes can easily become stark and bare and a little bit scary, right? Winter is a little bit scary as a subject. This is not one of those. What could you, could you, could you name or create a more friendly and colorful looking village in the dead of winter? This is also something that Maude Lewis did really well. These are things to think about. Keep a little notebook. You know, when we talk about stuff like this, hey, I've got some open ground in this composition. Sweep it around with the letter C. A letter C always makes a good composition element. Um, look back at things that you've liked of other people's and pull different motifs out of them. This is a great juvenile rug. This was covered up. A lot of the stuff that was inside sleeves was covered up with stickers so she could remind herself who had it or where it was or when she made it. So this was a Christmas gift for somebody and this was a pretty, pretty juvenile rug. Um, attra very attractive, I mean. Um, this is also on ribbon candy hooking. I definitely took the time to, um, oh, Melanie, I wanna come back to that comment. That's a smart comment. Um, I wanted to take the time to do this one for a couple of reasons. Um, it's hard to find juvenile rugs that have a great vintage fun feel, but that are also really suitable for both a beginner and an experienced hooker. Because as an experienced hooker, you could choose to leave this very folksy, um, or you could do all kinds of different things with it. Don't you love the color changing gray in the background? Doesn't that remind you of a much earlier rug? Don't you love the multiples of the elephants? Uh, the way that they run around the border, different colors, different shapes? Thank you for the link. That's the link, I think, to this one. Around the very border, there are silhouettes of little animals. They are not perfect, but you can tell on top you've got a duck, you've got a lamb, you've got a chick, you've got some kind of a little kitten. Down the bottom right, you see there's a, in the middle, there's some kind of a dog and a duck. On top, I think there's a small um, elephant. You can tell at the bottom a teddy bear, a turtle, maybe a pig, a cat, a Scotty dog. On the left-hand side, oh, I thought that was a fish. It's a whale. I'm going to have to alter that in the design. I just noticed the black spout coming out and a little giraffe. I mean, so sweet. One of the reasons I love this rug is because for me, and I know I've said this before and it's not a very, um, I don't know, woke sentiment, but I miss balloons. And I know you're not supposed to have them because I know they you lose them, you drop them, they, they fly out of your hand and they float over the ocean and they strangle a sea turtle and it's terrible and it's sad and I don't want that either. But I do miss balloons. And this just reminds me of so many bandstand nights and um, parties and carnivals. And yeah, I, I just I love to see balloons. If I can't see them in real life, I love to see them this way. Ryan says, elephants is my favorite on the night. Well, I can't imagine why with your safari suit on, right? <laughs> favorite animal, loyal and smart. And um, oh, oh, that comment disappeared. And Teddy is calling me again. I'm so sorry. When you hear buzzing, you know I'm being uh, haunted by my son. Oh, I oh no, did that comment go away? Oh, how weird. Did that go away for you too? I can't see Ryan's comment anymore. Um, my mom says, there's so much color in that snow scene. Okay, let me come back here for a minute because there's a couple great comments about this composition. Um, my mom says, so much color in that snow scene, unexpected, not the usual whites, tans, blacks, grays of winter, wild winter color. Absolutely. And isn't it amazing that it still holds as a winter scene? I mean, you look at it, there's no question. You don't, there's no way that this is spring or summer. This is absolutely a winter scene. 
It's Babar the elephant. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Melanie, you said, um, I like the large church, even though it's in the distance, it shows the importance. That is a smart, that is a very smart comment. You're absolutely right. And of course, the church is really the most important thing to her. It is the a staple of the community. It is the anchor of everything around it. It is the most important thing to Joanne. So that is a really smart um, idea and comment because, yeah, that it is the focal point of this piece because it is her world. Oh, there it is. Ryan says, elephants are my, fa my favorite this night. Favorite animal, loyal and smart. Never forget. Love the colors and how, the, how she shaped the rug. Yep, I agree. Let's come back here. I do too. It's a great composition. And because the sticker was on it, I had to kind of improvise around the border. And I made a much more complete border with animals running all the way around, repeating some of the animal motifs. Um, so I just tried to make smart decisions about what I thought uh, worked the best, you know, with what I couldn't see here. But I love this piece too. Oh my word. I, I love this piece. I love this piece so much. This is another one I put up and the way that I read the, that I drew it is very true to the way that it looks, but I spaced out some of the letters a bit more because I thought if you love this text, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. If you love this text, I just wanted the text to be a little bit less crowded and I wanted to keep the letters the same size. So I spaced it out a little bit differently, but if you end up liking this pattern, buying this pattern, hooking this pattern, um, I think you're going to like that very small change. The letters, the letters are super nice. You're right, Doreen. They are like, she does different letters for every piece. It kind of has that kind of um, feel of an illumination. These like oversized all uppercase letters. This is a beautiful take on a stained glass window with an angel in the center being the focal point with beautiful wings. She's got um, a, a silhouette of an angel on the left, a star, um, a, a bird or phoenix. And on the right, she's got a crown over Lord. She's got butterflies. She's got um, a harp. She's got different kinds of, of horns, right? Uh, maybe Gabriel's musical notes. And at the bottom, she's got a very pen Dutch kind of broken mosaic with a couple of flowers at the bottom. So soft, so lovely, so grounded. But what a beautiful piece that you could go in so many different directions with. It does have a border around the edge. Um, it's kind of curled back because this one is hanging on her wall very prominently. Um, it is so beautiful, isn't it, Suze? It is so beautiful. I just love the idea. Um, this does not need straight lines, right? Me too. I love that too. And you know, the lines don't even all meet. So, it, it, and I love that. It's crazy. It's a crazy quilt. So if you look to the left of the angel, you see that strip of yellow going up. You see how there's like a little sort of blibbity blob like on top it doesn't quite meet at an intersection I kept that um, because I wanted to I wanted to stay true to the feel of it and I did not want to make changes um, that altered the message of the piece or her piece because think of the way she hooks on her frame and think of how careful she is about what she's putting down I wanted to be sure to honor that and keep that completely intact I absolutely love this piece now here's another piece this is very very different much more patchwork driven this is another moment on the bed so remember that didn't sound quite right but you know what I mean remember there are layers of rugs right so the one that we're looking at is the central rug that has a gray border if you look at let us adore him we looked at that earlier with the poinsettia top and the text on bottom just focus on that gray rug that is its own rug now this is a long skinny rug kind of more of a hearth rug shape made up of a bunch of different quilt blocks that are all amazing. Look at these colors. Look at these colors. No, I mean, look at these. Look at this border, these soft flowers around the edges, very scrolling, very Pearl McGow. But, and remember, these are all her original patterns. Look in the center. Now, some of these look familiar. I think I see oak leaves, right? I think I see some squares that I recognize, but not like this. So look, just look at it closely, the changes of color, the repetitions, right? A little bit of a pen Dutch feel, very uh, kind of toll painting, folky feel, but certainly uh, the biggest and inspiration are, are historical quilt blocks. Look at the color changes. Let's look together. Now, remember, these are rugs that were on the floor forever. So she's like, don't mind. You know, they were on the floor. They, they were used for many, many, many years. Um, these are not uh, museum rugs. These are rugs that were used and then they were taken up 
uh, and put under the bed for quite a while. And it was great to look at them together. So for example, with this square, this could be boring, right? This could have very few colors. Look at how many colors she's put into this. There's one rule that she's following. If you're looking at her work and thinking, I don't think I have the color sense to do this. I don't think I have the right instinct. The, the rule that she's following, it's one rule. It's put something dark against something light. That's it. That's it. Make sure that the contrast is good enough. We, we are talking folk art here. We are not talking about middle ground, right? We are not talking about building layers and density. We are talking about put something dark next to something light. And that is it, right? So you can do this. You can play with color in this way. In this particular piece, the colors are wacky, right? She's got two very warm colors in the top right-hand corner. I might have moved one of them over, but now that I'm looking at it, who cares? The bottom two corners are both blue and gray or top and gray, very similar. Who cares? This is what's contributing to the folk art feel of it. She has got four hearts around the edges and the one north and west are the same color. She didn't stagger them. She doesn't care. She's plugging in colors that work. They're supposed to be scared me. The screen just blinked. Oh no, was it, did it go, did I go away for a minute? Oh, I think I went away for a minute. Oh no. Let me know if we are back. It looks like we're live again. My screen blinked and I didn't realize that I was off. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to you here. We back. That sounds good. How long was I gone? And it's, I've got like, a, what's, and, and not, what's the word when you lose your memory? Doesn't matter. Um, okay. Okay, very short. Okay. Sorry about that. My mouth was running, but I think we were good. Let's, let's continue on and hope for the best. Couple of seconds. Good stuff. That's a relief. So we were looking at this one and just saying, you know, look at the breakdown of color. This is really smart. This is good stuff. This is stuff that we can all do. Put your darks against your lights. Put your lights against your darks. There's no more rules. Look at this one. These are just really uh, <laughs> too long, Sus. That is so sweet. That is so sweet. Look at this one. It's just a very basic, it looks like a pie, right? Or a, a daisy or uh, a variation on a Dresden plate. It also has kind of superimposed on it. If you're a quilter, a pinwheel. You see the pinwheel, the four kind of blades uh, radiating out. It could be, if you drew it, you could easily look at this and become intimidated and say, ah, I think this is too complicated. But look at it. It's not. You got this. If you want to do this, you got this. There's kind of like a um, quarter circle in the four corners. Yeah, the pie shapes are different colors. Yes, the pie shapes get smaller as it goes in. Who cares? You just, you just fill it in, right? You just paint by number. You fill it in. You put the darks next to the lights. You realize you finished it. You, it looks great. It has a great kind of uh, prismatic kind of color wheel breakdown to it. You could go even further. Exactly, Melanie, the color wheel. Exactly. Um, so good. So good. I love her colors. I love this one too, right? This is a fairly familiar kind of floral motif. We see this a lot. Seeing them as fours with a kind of heart stem or like a bud stem meeting in the center. Fantastic pen dutch design. Wacky background colors. A little bit of color shifting in the brown in the top left. Fantastic. Got a little bit of lilac, periwinkle, kind of blue bonnet color. Unexpected. See how the flowers are split in half? This is not rocket surgery, is it? This is doable. She's got a bunch of blocks like this that she just put down, and I bet she was having a party in her heart hooking this all up and figuring it out as she went. Something like this. Now, this is a much simpler design. She's kind of got like a, a trefoil kind of a uh, abstract shape in the four corners. And in the center, she's got kind of a cloister thing happening, right? Kind of a um, four petal like cloister architectural uh, effect going on. She's got it split into quarters. Well, that's easy. But what is the what is the prestige in this block? Well, it's this ring of, of dit dots. It's these big, colorful polka dots. Talk about circus, right? Talk about, looks like a juggler, right? I mean, all of these colors in the air. Why do you have to make them all the same color? It's so pretty when it looks like this. It does, again, kind of evoke the color wheel. I mean, it's so pretty. It's so unexpected. Now, this is a different piece altogether. I wonder if this, let me just pull it up a little. Um, you know, she did a crazy number of bags, like 40 bags uh, in one year kind of a thing. 
Uh, she puts different handles on different ones for different people who she has in mind. Um, and these bags are four sided. They're, they're, they're deep enough that she also does the sides. So for example, beautiful bird. Imagine, imagine receiving this as a gift. Uh, what an honor. What a gift. This is the back of this particular bag. And hang on here. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't do the sides. I'll do more sides for you another time. She hooked about 40 of these and they are so deep. I know I said this on Wednesday. They are so deep that she also has two different sides. So for all of these tote bags that she makes and then she sews on the handles, you've got the front design, you've got the back design, you've got the two sides. So she's often putting years and initials and things like that. It's just crazy. It's crazy. It is lovely. Oh, I love the bird. I do too. There's a lot of these. I didn't put them all on the slideshow tonight. I think I might actually get through the slides tonight. Now I'm wondering if I have enough content. Holy mackerel. Now, this is another great beauty. And this one I don't think has been on the floor. I think this one has been on the wall. This is a really sort of pristine white background here. Yeah, Melanie, those were bags. You want to be her friend, right? I mean, she really, talk about like the spirit of giving. She is just, it, 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 it's unreal the way that she gives, right? She just, um, she's just such a good person. Um, this is another great design. It does have that Persian feel again. It's very paisley driven. It doesn't have the complexity of what we usually see with paisleys, kind of the mid 20th century, the Jacobian borderline paisley designs with lots of uh, true Persian uh, detailing, which can be a lot, like a lot to approach. These are paisleys that she drew on. Picture her working directly with all of those Sharpies on there. I do too, Karen. It's just amazing. She just dropped a bunch of paisleys in. Do you see how in the middle she, she created a design motif in that she put in just like a band, like a little scroll, like a little branch, two little flowers in the center in black, almost like a woodcut quality to them, um, and then a bunch of paisleys. She just drew them on there. She probably drew as she went. She filled them in however she was feeling it. Stephanie, those are good bags, huh? Is Paisley dear to your heart? I feel the same way. I feel it is so exotic, a bit magical. And I feel it's a great vehicle for whatever colors and patterns you want. The larger the Paisley you're putting down, the bigger the pattern you can get in there. You can get wallpaper type patterns. You can just do kind of outlining. You can do letters. You can do scales and lamb, lamb's tongues, things like that, real traditional things. You can just... Uh, do concentric rounds, right? Just lots of outlining. You can see she's done lots of things here. And in between the paisleys, she's put these little flowers that do feel like little Jacobian flowers. Now, remember, she is, I think, 84 years old. She was, uh, sorry, I almost knocked the furniture down there. Hooking when she was 19. She was watching her mother hook. Neither of them were trained. They didn't take classes or anything like that. Joanne would have seen a lot of paisley designs. I mean, without a doubt, she's seen a lot of paisley designs. And this is her take on a paisley. And paisleys usually include this collection of flowers, don't they? Because paisleys by nature are super British. Design-wise, they're super British. And you do get a scattering of these very British-looking flowers that go with it. She's included these flowers, but she has still made it completely her own. Look at the way she's broken down the different shapes of the paisley. Look at the different patterns that she's put in each one. Look at the way that the, uh, the outline or the border of each of these paisleys, she sure didn't look, no, she looks amazing, doesn't she? And she looks amazing. Um, she is amazing. She, she's filled in the different paisleys in different ways. And, and there is no sort of unified look or color plan. Um, and you know, it doesn't matter to the overall look of the piece. Again, you work yourself into this weird mental corner or a cul-de-sac where you say, I think I got too much going on. I think it's going to be too busy. Not this time. This is why her, de her designs appeal to me so much because they are original designs. Um, and because she is untrained and she likes to work in the folky primitive style, her mother liked to work with number threes. She never has. And because she likes this style, she automatically and instinctively designs for a primitive folky style. So if you are approaching it as somebody who wants to try the style or is a beginner, these designs are going to be perfect for you. You really cannot go wrong. And you can see there, there isn't a ton of background, but it does change color to the top. She ran out. She put a different light color background in. 
you know, in these moments, if you are tormented by this problem of, of running out, yeah, you can pull out some of the pure white from the rest of the body of the rug and, and swap it out, you know, introduce some of those pure white, whites up to the top so you don't get this, like, divide of color. Or you just leave it and you say, good enough for me. C is for cookie and it's good enough for me. I love it. It works. Who cares? It's absolutely beautiful just the way it is. So I took some close-ups of this because I wanted you to see she's using lots of textured wool. She's using lots of solids. And remember, she doesn't use um, all wool. She doesn't use much wool. She does a lot with cotton. She doesn't like cotton jersey as much. She doesn't like things that stretch as much. But she uses what she's got. So she uses lots of different materials. I'm just going to take a sip while you look at that. Just gives you great, um, I'm just looking at the different designs and thinking, you know, she's even introduced, I see a little leaf on top. That's smart because that leaf or sort of coffee bean shape really kind of mimics a paisley. And if you want some little ones in there, particularly if you know you're running out of your background material, might as well do that. They're close enough, right? They're close enough that it's not going to distract from the composition. You're not going to say, what are those little things? It all, it all looks like it fits together perfectly. Uh, and certainly this is wool, the black and white hound's tooth. And then you see how in the center, tiny, tiny bits, tiny bits. And I don't think she did tiny bits because she wanted to be fine and fancy. I think she did tiny bits probably because she had little scraps that she never throws out. Sue so says, I've always loved outsider art, art from the soul. Me too, me too. That's a good subject, right? That's just a good sort of umbrella term for folk art that comes, you know, contemporary folk art. Um sculpture, painting, um, all kinds of untrained art um, that comes from people who are on the outside, on the periphery of the craft, the people who are not likely to have gallery shows and expensive college, college educations, um, really the sort of height of, of what folk art is. I just loved looking in detail uh, at everything that she did. This is the corner where she signs it with the JW. So you see, maybe you've noticed in many of her pieces, um, she does usually sign her pieces, and she certainly puts a label and stuff on them. She marks her stuff really carefully. So um, it's an important, important message to us all, too. But look at this blue paisley. You see how there's kind of like a cross-hatched uh, grid running over it, like a mesh? It looks like it's maybe in yarn. She just goes for anything. She goes for anything. And at the end of the day, this kind of the paisley rug that we're talking about here, at the end of the day... Isn't it a hit or miss rug? I mean, really, isn't it a hit or miss? When we think about hit or miss, sometimes we think it has to be some kind of geometric, right? Because that we always talk about hit or miss and then look at some kind of a gridded rug. No, you can do something like this. Uh, Melanie, you were saying you use stencils, right? You often use stencils. If you don't feel comfortable drawing directly on the on the template, just trace a stencil right off of the computer or or, or cut one out that you like or hearts or anything and use it as your stencil. Maybe do a whole bunch. Just put them down on your backing. Trace around them with a Sharpie. And then maybe cut the shape a little bit smaller, right? So do as many as you want so that the shape, you have lots of the bigs, and then cut the shape a little bit smaller, and then do a whole bunch of mediums. And then cut the shape smaller, and then do a whole bunch of smalls, and extra smalls, and extra, extra smalls. Uh, and then you, then you realize that you have filled out your composition, and you are ready to blast on it. And you have got a hit or miss. All you need is that one background material. And in this case, it's not one background material. It's just light. Do I want dark or do I want light? Hey, if you have lots of a specific color, teal blue, peacock blue, eggplant, whatever, do it. But if you don't, just say to yourself, I want it dark or I want it light. And then every single motif, whether I have 20 paisleys, 10 paisleys, or 200 paisleys, depending on the size and the scale, you just do them all differently as you go, and that is your hit or miss rug. I mean, it's such a great idea. It's such a liberating idea to be reminded that this is another form of hit or miss, right? This is not filling in paisleys and color planning. This is flying by the seat of your, of your pants. Does she have any of her mother's work? You know, Sharon, that is a great question. Um, let me do this, and then let me think for a second. Oh, let's look at this while I think. That's even better. You know, I asked her so much about her mother's work. 
I think she did show me some of her mother's work. I don't think it was on the wall. I think it was framed. Uh, I'm going to have to ask her again. Uh, she did have some of her mother's work without a doubt. Um, I remember because I remember when we sat down, I still had the idea that this was a small story and we sat down and I, did, I didn't want her to feel like I was interviewing her. You know, it's like, you know, unnerving. Um, but when she said that she learned to hook from her mother, I, I knew I wanted to go there pretty quickly. So I thought, all right, let me start. Um, let me, let me start at the beginning. And I thought, you know, I said to her, so starting with your mother's work, you know, was your mother trained? Did your mother take class? I asked a lot of mother questions, like right off the bat. She, her, she's like this. She remembered the answers to all of them. Uh, nope, she never took classes. She did like the fine cuts, you know. Um, she liked the style of that time. She liked uh, what everybody else was doing. She liked doing the shading and all that. And I feel like at that moment she showed me some stuff. And I didn't photograph it because I kind of waited a while um, I didn't want her like getting up and getting down and getting up and getting. So I kind of sat and waited a while. And then I thought, God, you got to remember to go return to some of these subjects. But I forgot to return to that. So I will return to that because I'll certainly be visiting her again. Um, and, this, and, and for me, the story started with her mother. Uh, because part of the beauty of it is that she part of the reason she loves it so much is that she got it from her mother. So one of the gifts that her mother gave her was like learning this craft. So the story does start there. Uh, it's good that you said that because project that I'll be working on, working on a book about her, I will certainly start with her mom. And um, there isn't a better way to start, is there? Yes, Melanie, that advent calendar is available um, on Ribbon Candy Hooking right here. I put it up there on pre-order, so it'll ship uh, between in about seven to seven to 14 days, depending on when you order. It is 14 different boxes. There's nothing in here now. But it makes like a village. Some of them are like tall houses like this. They're all numbered. Um, and then some of them are the these guys. But it's 24 boxes. And I'm going to put a different fiber in each one. So some of them will just have... I, I wrote on the website, I figured out like at least 200 of this, yards of this or whatever. At least a quarter yard of wool uh, cut into strips. You'll see it in the description on the website. Oh, you know what I wanted to show you? Good thing you said that. Um, different fibers, mostly wool, uncut, not cut, and wool yarn. But I'm putting tons of novelty yarn. Each box, each day that you open it will be um, something different to work with. So you can save it. Um, you can use it right away if you have a hit or miss piece. If you're doing a paisley thing, you could do the paisley thing with this advent calendar. Man, would that be amazing. Um, I think it, I think I put it at like sixty five dollars. I'm pretty sure that's what I did. Tried to keep the price very low because it's it's something for the holidays, and I wanted everybody to be able to get it who wanted to get it. And you know what happened while I was at the uh, Cooked in the Mountain? I was chatting with my friend. Oh, I was chatting with my friend Susan of Mad River um, Wool. It's a store. In, in Vermont, and I taught there last year. It was a it was an oversold class. Such nice people there. I hope to be teaching there again in the next couple of months. We're going to talk talk it um, out and figure out what date works. Um, she is wonderful, and she had a little stall set up in the vendor area. And I walked. We were talking for ages, and I walked by, and she had this basket like this, with all this all this stuff in it. Right. Let me show you. I'm gonna put the camera right in here. Get ready. It's gonna be. Too, too much, too much knowledge, right? Like all of this kind of stuff, right? All these locks, all of the curls, like directly the curls, because you can hook those. You just hook these guys, right? They're dyed all these crazy colors. I mean, just so tactile and and lovely. So I said, I walked by them and I said, oh my God, I think I need those for the advent calendar because I can stuff at least one box out of the 24 with these locks. And what a great kind of colorful, um, thing to be able to go to if you just need a little bit here a little bit there so she said well how much do you want and I said well I don't want to wipe you out right because like she's got several more days bending at this thing um so I said you know I don't want to wipe you out and she said oh underneath here I have this whole bag because what she had on display was like a fraction of that and I said can I take the whole bag and so she sold me the whole bag. So that is one of the materials. Different things like that, but also very traditional materials are going to be in this Advent calendar. And I think it's called um, Advent Calendar Village Set, something like that. It's the only Advent calendar on ribbon candy hooking. 
So it's going to be super fun. Thank you for asking. Super fun. Uh, um, Barbara, I am going to write a book about her. I am. And the la I know it's like the last thing I need is another book because I'm working on the second one. I have two others that I've started, like, well, that I'm well into. But when I went over there, I mean, it was just like this overwhelming feeling of destiny and of just feeling like it was like uh, fated that I went over there and that I met her and that I live close enough to her that I can hear this whole story and get, I just felt like there's a lot of people who do a lot of work, but her work has never been seen. Like she's never showed it. She doesn't enter it. She doesn't submit it to magazines. Her work has never been seen. Um, and I thought, I just, I'm going to hate my, not hate myself, but I'm going to regret it forever if I don't make the time to work on this project. Because like the rugs we're looking at tonight, the Cranberry Island, you know, the God's Eye View, um, every rug for her has this great story attached to it. So it's like, all I'm doing is relaying it and recording it. And it's not, I mean, it's a huge project, but it's not a huge project. It's not like I'm doing original content. That's one of the reasons I'm hoping people are going to order some of her rugs and stuff too, because as I put the book together, I've got to finish the current one first, the design like, but I'll start working on hers with her on a regular basis, right? Just to get it going. Um, I'm really hoping that other people will hook her work and I will too, or punch it or do wool applique or prati or whatever you want with her design so that that's also present in the book. I think she would, I think she would be super honored and blown away um, by that kind of a sort of layer of interest in that book and the idea um, that knowing her legacy is safe and that all of these hundreds of original designs that she's done will be there for future hookers. Um, you know, it, I think it's, I, I have to, I have to do it. Um, excellent. Thank you. It sounds, it is a wonderful story. There were so many. I have, I'm, I'm not even scratching the surface, so... Um, all right, let's come back over here. And yeah, this I think this was my favorite Paisley. So we're giving this an extra long showcase. So come back over here. And okay, so there's a bit of a shadow on this. This one was behind the couch, but you can see what's going on here. And you can see that it's good, right? This is such a cool composition. This is another one that'll come up over the weekend. It's just a collection of motifs. Right? She's got a very contained and subtle border, the nice gray with a cranberry running through, like postage stamp kind of a design. She split up the backgrounds, probably because she's running out of color. She's got wonderful balance between that little kind of miniature flying geese patchwork, red and black on the left, and then the black corner on the right that contains all kinds of shapes of like vases or ornaments, maybe eggs, swirls, paisleys, butterfly, heart, all kinds of things. And because you know the way she works, she's just drawing them on there. She's plugging in colors where she sees them. She likes that central wheel that I'm going to have to ask her what that wheel represents. If it's like a wheel of life, something like that. Wheels can represent so many different things, but she uses a lot of them um, as a motif. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to drill down into that and a lot of other things, but you can see how the background is a real mashup of different motifs, different colors. What it has is tons of energy. Looks like a Ferris wheel. Oh, I love that. I love that. It does look like a Ferris wheel. It really does. It is so pretty. I mean, all of this, the, it, the energy. And, and it does, again, remind us that no matter how much you put down there, if you're thinking to yourself, this ain't going to work, right? This is not cohesive. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You put it down there, you work as you go, you stand back a lot, and you say to yourself, I need more black in the corner, I could use a little bit more light blue. And at the end of the day, keep working, keep stepping away, keep working some more. You are gonna evolve a piece that is completely unique and your own. And it, it's not gonna have a color plan, and it's not gonna have a strong uh, compositional uh, foundation. It's going to be folk art and it's going to be yours and it's going to be filled with your favorite colors and your favorite motifs. And this is how you do this. So I just loved this piece. It really stood out to me. This is a close up and this one still is on the floor, but it is behind the couch. So it's not like the normal uh, way of traffic, but you can see how she's making connections. She's linking things with this swirl, right? It looks like almost part of a board game track with this color change coming down like a candy cane. You can see how, and this is its own conversation. And I'm going to say, 
looking just at this photo alone, I can't think of another artist who makes spontaneous connections the way that Joanne does. I can't think of anybody that I've seen this with before. We've seen it a lot tonight. I'll point it out next time we see it again. She does a lot of these spontaneous segues that are often very, very colorful. The shape has no relationship to what's around it. Thank you, Suze. And it just comes out beautifully. And then look at the bottom corner, another sort of color wheel feel to that piece. Look at the, at, at the bottom right, the black and red, the flying geese design, one little bit of, of blue. Now, these are questions that as I, I sit down with her again and again and again, um, God willing, that we'll be able to talk about. Why did you put a little bit of blue in there? It looks like you have more black, right? There's some black at the top. Why did you put a little bit of blue? It might mean something to her. You know, she might say, well, that's a little bit of sky or that's a little bit of this. Or, or maybe she'll say, I ran out of the black and I, and I didn't want to pull from another place. But I want to find out the questions to this because in terms of content for a book, only a rug hooker can have these conversations, right? Um, th th this is not for everybody. But these are the kinds of conversations that I like to see and to hear and to read or to see in the sidebar because it gets me thinking. And then bits and pieces, you know, you remember things later and you think, yeah, I remember uh, seeing a rug. Maybe I can't recall whose it was or the, or the way that the rug looked, but I remember that this, this was handled in this way and it worked. I'm going to try it, right? The more repetition you get talking about these different kinds of tricks and devices, each person has their own. Joanne has a ton. Each person has some. Some of us have lots. Some of us have a few. Joanne has a crazy number of, of tricks that she does again and again and again. This is a similar kind of design. We've got like a nice golden rectangle of a shape, a nice big rectangle, good proportions. In the center, she's got that, tri that um, checkerboard going. So playful and fun. She does so much stuff that evokes board games, doesn't she? And then she's got this beautiful ring of very Victorian looking flowers. Look at the way the ground changes around there. Right? And composition-wise, she's got one flower at the far left. She hasn't broken it down into borders. Why do you think that is? I don't know the answer. It could be that she had it on her frame and it was all nailed down. Suze, I love how you put Mr. and Mrs. Claus there too. That is so funny. I don't know if it was nailed down and she forgot that the border was different. Right? Maybe she returned to it. Who knows? Who cares? It works the way that it is. It gives your eye this kind of break, this inconsistency where you think, ah... I wonder if that was meant to be. And then you start thinking about what the story is and you make up the story and, and it, it, doing it is fun. The play is the thing, right? Talking about it is the thing. She does have this uh, beautiful, very pop art kind of Greek key design going around most of the border. Um, that as a device is fantastic. What I love the most about it is none of the lines are straight. I just love it. It doesn't have enough um, craziness to be a crazy quilt feel, but it does have enough sort of inconsistency, incongruities to be, for me, super interesting. So she's got that outer Greek key design in the outer border. And then she comes into this kind of broken um, diamond. And you see there are hearts placed inside of them as they go around. In between the diamond shapes, you automatically get that anvil shape. There's no way around that. Can't be avoided. So that's very cool. Stupid spell check. Oh, uh, that was a we can always read past typos, right? Stupid computer. But this is just stu such a cool composition. And I love how inside some of the Greek key uh, patterns on the outer border, she just fills in the block in a color. Like she doesn't follow she doesn't follow through with that swirl. She just fills it in uh, and, and regards it as a shape, right? And not a, not a line. So interesting. More interest. This is a close-up of that same rug. And you see some, I'm going to take a sip. Just take a look at some of these patterned materials that she's using. They are not all wools. With a design like this, you could really, in place of that Greek key border, you could really uh, introduce a lot of text, some kind of a cipher. Could be a lot of fun. This is one of two patterns that, that she showed me out of a lot of rugs that was not her own design. This was, this was a pattern. She doesn't remember whose it was. Maybe you do that uh, April, her buddy April, the neighbor, brought over that she had found at like a church fair or a bazaar, something like that. So 
April saw a hook drug pattern, and even, and even though she knows that um, Joanne likes to hook her own stuff, she thought, can't pass on this, right? So some kind of rummage sale situation, and she picks up this rug, and she brings it to Joanne, and Joanne thinks, well, I could just use the burlap backing, I'm paraphrasing, um, but she liked the design, and <laughs> I do too, Karen, and you've seen rugs like this, right? But have you ever seen one that looks like this? I mean, look, she, she's handled the barn real well. Lots of good color changes there. Uh, and the kind of little L off of the barn. Look at the sky. That pink coming up right behind the barn. The crazy yellow and the crazy orange. There is white in the background with a bit of purple and lilac. That tree changes color wildly. There is a little kind of wagon wheel out front, right? She's using blacks in the right places. She's trying to pick out parts of the story that um, will lend uh, a shape to the motif because this is a this is a, a real strong uh, line drawing and, and she knows that she doesn't want to lose it completely and abstract it to the point that it's confusing but she knows that she's got to be her and she's going to break it down into some crazy colors and there's not going to be a rhyme or reason to the way she breaks it down she's going to figure it out as she goes along so even with a commercial pattern like this can you imagine the challenge if you were to do this on purpose to try to loosen up enough to get away from what you expect to see and do this instead. I think it would be extremely difficult, but this is how you do it. You look at this for inspiration. It's a great inspiration piece. This is a close-up of behind the barn. You see the different patterns, the different textures. That pink is definitely not wool. You can see it's like ribbed. So that almost looks like it's a stretchy material. She has got to have her brights in every piece. And mom, I think you said the other day about the trees being green when she uses blue in the trees. It does give you the illusion that you are seeing the sky in between the branches and the leaves. It's so smart and filigree looking, isn't it? Oh, I love that peppermint porter. That is good stuff. Now, this is, again, I, I could have had another uh, several hundred uh, photos if I went through the books and took every picture, but it was just, it was just too much. So, for example, this story made me quite angry. Um, this is a house that was going up right near her in her immediate neighborhood, and um, she, she watched it, and she looked at it, and she hooked it. And then she tried to give it to the guy, and the guy didn't want it, who owned the house. What a jerk. Doesn't that make you mad, too? Who cares, right? Who cares? But it is a beautiful piece. I think it's an amazing piece. Look at the way she's handled the, the hook drug, obviously, at the bottom. The fat clouds in the sky. There's a little weather vane on the top of it. Look at the way she's handled the trees and the windows, the colors of trees in the background. Completely unrealistic. Absolutely beautiful. I really like the closer look. They would make great small uh, rug. Or Absolutely, they would. Absolutely, they would. I agree, Stephanie. There's, they're just such different pieces. They're so different. This is very different. This one will be up on ribbon candy hooking. Um, I was working on this one when I had to peel off and get in the car. Uh, an Egyptian motif. So she did this for, for someone specific. I can't remember if it was a family member or a friend, but she looked at um, books. That's right, Melanie. That right. Always going to be jerks, Karen, huh? <laughs> I mean, what a jerk, right? But anyway, uh, we won't even talk about him and give him that kind of... Ugh. Blech. So she looked at all kinds of books on Egyptian art, and she put she pulled out motif at motifs and uh, symbols of Ra and the eye and all of the uh, different kinds of hieroglyphs that you see in Egyptian art. Um, and it's such a it's such a bang up piece, isn't it? Some of the compartments are busier. She's got the scarab beetle, um, and some of them are less busy. But it's just so cool, isn't it? It's so different. And you can see that she tried to use colors that were a bit kind of more clay colors, kind of maybe what we would call Santa Fe colors, um, lots of warm um, red colors like the clay colors, but then lots of blues and turquoise colors because those are Egyptian colors too. And then the kind of deserty colors. I love Egyptian and Greek art, art too, Sharon. I love tapping into that classical vein and looking at that ancient work. Uh, and I think this is an incredible hat tip to so many different motifs, so many of them done in silhouette, so many of them picked out in a kind of a graphic way. Ah, oh, it, it's just another great piece, isn't it? 
This is another great piece through the sleeve of the book, Noah's Ark, right? She loves these subjects. We've got the ark in the middle and the door popped open and here are all the animals in twos. Here is Noah. There's a rainbow in the top right hand corner. It must mean that the water is receding. I think the water must be receding because this looks like ground, doesn't it? it? It's a lot of nice symbols, mom, isn't it? You know, the part in the story of Noah's Ark where uh, he sends out the dove and the dove comes back with the olive branch. And that must mean that the trees are not underwater anymore. Because if they were, he wouldn't be able to pick off a piece of the tree and bring it back in his beak. So this is like this moment of, of hope. Sand. Absolutely, it is sand. I can't believe you're on in Scotland. It's so late. <laughs> um, but I love this moment. You can see little bits of water, like it's drying up here and there. But you can it, it's that feeling that everything is going to be okay. Uh, I think this is another great piece. Melanie says, I was lucky enough to see the King Tut exhibit when it toured. It was in the Seattle Center. Now, when was that? I'm curious because I, I feel like it's toured more than once. I saw the, t the King Tut exhibit, but it must have been more than 20 years ago. And I'm just wondering if it was the same one. It was a really long time ago. I remember I got from the souvenir store. What's the right word? Is it um, like, is it like canopic? canopic canister, something like that. You know, they would have those jars that were kind of round with like a character of a different god on top. Can canopic or canopic, is that the right word? Or am I making that up? I got a couple of those canisters and I wonder where they are now. They, they were so pretty. I love it how at exhibits like that, the museum stores have such cool things to take away to remember, right? Um, but I feel like the King Tut exhibit toured more recently too. It's just been a really long time for me. Hey, oh, thank you so much. I love knowing that you're there. You know how I feel about Scotland. Uh, Sharon says, oh, I saw the Tut exhibit in Seattle also sometime in the 90s. Okay, so maybe it was the same one that I saw. It was a long time ago. It was so wonderful, though. It was so wonderful. Melody says, yes, it was probably in the 70s. It was before. Okay, I joined the Navy in 1981. Yeah, it was touring for a long time, just like the Titanic exhibit. Remember, remember it toured for like decades. Um, but of course, it had a lot of cities canopic jars. I think it was. I think that is the right word. Um, so they were so pretty. I love the proportion of the big fat jar with this small head on top that represented like one of the gods. It was so cool. I think we're all, well, some of them, I think the tour probably started in the 70s. I probably saw it in the 90s. It could have been two completely different things, but I feel like I saw it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I can't imagine I would have seen it anywhere else because maybe Boston. Uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts, but I wouldn't have gone much further than that. Um, could have seen it in London, actually. Who knows? Who knows? I have the ticket stub somewhere. I've been keeping a diary since I was like 14. So th that information is, is not lost. That's somewhere. All right, let's come back down here. And I think we're going to get through our slides tonight. Another beautiful um, sentiment, let your light so shine. And that's Matthew, I can't make this one out. Is it 618, 613, 618, 616? I'm not that good. Um, I love this. This to me looks like, it's probably not Portland headlight, but it looks like a very recognizable, um, thank you. Yes, that's them, the canopic jars. God, sometimes I wish I could remember where I put my phone or my keys, but I can remember canopic jars from 20 years ago. Isn't that unfortunate, the way it works? 616, thank you, Melanie. 616, let your light so shine. So beautiful. And here's the lighthouse shining out like a beacon, a beacon of safety, right? A beacon of home. Um, what a great symbol, a lighthouse with a quote like this. You can see she did a lot in the sky that was a bit challenging, right? She's kind of lined the clouds a little bit underneath. She's got some rays of light like it's early morning or late in the day over on the left-hand side, and the, and the color of the water changes from quite light to quite dark. Exciting when it gets close to the rocks. And then all this variety in the rocks, is it is it crazy bushes, is it rose hips, and, and all this knotted craziness of all the bushes that live on the edge of the rocks? Um, who knows? It's so abstract. Uh, so much going on there, so much patterning. But you certainly make out that it is a seascape, and it's a very recognizable lighthouse. It's just it could be so many lighthouses. I'd have to look through my book of lighthouses to really pinpoint it. But I thought, what a beautiful. It's going to be there, Karen, this weekend. It's definitely going to be there. These are all ones that I had out, and I just ran out of time. I like this one, too. This is another great floral. It's like the scatter pattern uh, sc scatter pa pattern that we saw earlier. Tongue twister. Uh, 
interesting border on this one, right? It has kind of it, that postage stamp feel, but it's a bit more uh, resolving into kind of a crest shape at the top. Very different border, very sort of, um, it looks almost like um, brass findings or something, you know, something you'd see at the setting of a, of, of a piece of jewelry in, like a gem setting. Uh, cool border. And then we see kind of the cattails, different plants, a little bit of water so that uh, it could provide a background for a water lily. Uh, and a couple of lily pads, but your eye just travels around this to all of the different colors, all of the different shapes, all of the different varieties of flowers. It is so pretty. And again, remember the paisley, she said, I'm going to do a white, a white background. And this one, she said, I'm going to do a dark background. And she just layered in things that she drew as she went along, figured it out as she went along. You have that stability of, you know, the background's lighter, you know, the background's dark. It becomes stable. The composition becomes stable no matter how busy it is. You stay away from very dark colors and you keep lights and brights against that dark background or vice versa if it's light. Uh, and you just keep going and you just keep stepping back. And sooner rather than later, you're going to see that the pattern is evolving uh, in a really successful way. I promise you. That might be the end of the slideshow, actually. Wait a minute. Let me come up here. We looked at these guys. No, I know there's at least, okay, nope, not quite. So, um, oh, now I hope we can get through these. <laughs> this was her, this is another behind the coucher, and you can tell because you can see my shadow legs. Uh, there's no way else I could uh, have taken it. So we'll look at this one more uh, when I photograph it better. But this was her COVID rug, and I wish I could read the border. Um, it's another beautiful passage from the Bible. Uh, maybe you can read it. But it's her COVID rug. And one of the things she said to me was, I am so sick of the color camel. Um, I have way too much camel. I dye it. But sometimes it's hard to get away from that warm base that camel is. So with this rug, she's like, I'm using my camel. Let's use it up. She, you never use up camel, right? It's like, uh, it's like the blob. Remember the movie, The Blob? It just keeps coming. But she used camel in the background. And she used different motifs to show different times of the year, different seasons, jack-o'-lantern, snowman, right, right through the year of COVID. Unexpected, summertime sun, um, different motifs. She does show at one point at the bottom, sort of the bottom left. Oh, thank you, Melanie. The Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. Thank you. That, that is exactly what it was. We read it while we were standing there, and it was absolutely beautiful. So this is a great passage to use for a COVID rug because she was looking for strength and assurance, and it was a scary time, wasn't it? The footsteps in this, she told me, are meant to represent the six feet apart, the distancing, and how far apart from everybody she felt during this time. Uh, the clock, there were all different things that... Um, she included in this piece so that um, she felt like it was a real testament to how she felt during this time. I thought it was an extraordinary rug. I loved going through the motifs with her. Sorry about that. I'm a... What's going on? Wait a minute. I'm just messing it up left and right. There we go. I knew I had a close up. So down at the bottom, um, that is like, that's, that's what COVID looks like, right? Like under a microscope. Uh, she's got the different planet. She's got lots of different motifs here. Uh, I'll certainly include a lot of detail on this when I write about it because this was one of her most symbolic rugs. Um, sometimes it's just about how it looks. Sometimes it's just about being pretty. This is one that was really symbolic for her. So, so it was important for me too. This, I think, is my favorite rug of hers. This one just got me. So this is hanging on the wall. Let me take a sip so I can reset myself. This is such a personal rug because how she feels about um, church and, and religion and her faith. This rug represents all of the all of the churches that she has been involved in in her life, starting from the beginning. So she's got the names kind of um, in initials, right? She knows what they mean. But this is a it's a it's a mashup. It's a pop art mashup of what all of the churches look like that she has been a part of. And I thought, you have got to be kidding. This is just, this, this is what, this is what really got me when I saw this, because I was like, whew, um, yeah, this is her life. Like, this is the best part of her life. This is the, the golden strand that runs through her life. Uh, and this is a record of it in pictures. And she drew these pictures and she's got 
different motifs and different ones, different trees and different places, different backgrounds, houses in the background, village setting, set off in a field. It's just exactly Melanie. Talk about a story rug. I guess it was inevitable that she would create this kind of a record for herself, but it is so beautiful. And, and, and she made it extra grand by adding all of these borders to it, right? Like, like as if it's not amazing all, in a, yeah, all on its own. She added all these borders. And with every border, it's almost like its own new prayer, like rosaries, rows of rosaries going around. It's almost like she's thinking and contemplating. This I'm, lay, I'm layering craziness on. But she's thinking and contemplating, and she doesn't want to stop hooking the rug. She wants it to keep going, and she just keeps adding borders. And it just becomes more and more important with every border that she adds on, all of these colors that she's adding on. Um, oh, my gosh, I think I just saw a mouse. Or, you know, maybe it was a reflection in my glasses of a car outside. I just got the heebie-jeebies, but it is what it is. It was probably a reflection. I just saw movement. I always got the heebie-jeebies when I'm by myself. The buildings are fabulous. Oh, it happened again. It's got to be a car. Whew. Um, yeah, this one is probably one that I won't recreate immediately as a uh, pattern. I, I might ask her if she minds if I make it into a pattern. Um, it is pure joy. It's all feeling. Uh, it's such a personal rug. I don't know if other people would want to hook this rug. Um, I love the idea of the rug. I would want to hook this rug just the way that it is with all the same colors and everything. Um, but I'll have to ask her about this because this is a really personal rug and many of hers are. I, I have a feeling she loves to share. Like she loves to share the story. She loves to share the faith. Um, and I, I have a feeling that she, that, that would be a great compliment to her. But I just, I just love this rug. I think I took some close-ups of it. Um... This is a close-up of, you know, one of the churches with this patterned roof, um, different colors. Sorry, I'm distracted. I'm looking for that again. I'm, I'm nuts. So you can see all of the layers that she's put in, all of the shapes that she's built in. It's super, super, super folky. We're approaching the border here. This is a steeple on top of this one. Um, yeah, this one really spoke to me. I thought it was an extraordinary, an extraordinary piece. Um, this one, for whatever reason, maybe it was because she, ha she found that she had a lot of sky. Uh, she put like the... the goose or the, the bird flying across the, the sun or the moon um really beautiful and even what she's doing in the trees here just makes me wonder what she's thinking and what she means to do if adding color is a big thing for her it's almost like she goes too far with just filling in a color and it's almost like this impulsive thing for her that she then needs to just insert a crazy color that that really has no relationship to the composition or um, the storytelling. Amazing, right? Amazing. So I took a few more pictures of the borders um, because it was a big deal for me, the border. She's got just a straight up checkered border on the very outer edge. She's got a floral border within. And, and, and you know, isn't it funny how with like the floral border, that is a very subdued border. That is something that we've seen a million times, right? This kind of like padula type flower with this connected vine. It is something that we've seen, but interesting that she would put this in between two very complicated borders, right? It's almost like she's softening up um, the flow of the border. It's also a very different scale than the other two borders. Just thought this was super, super interesting. And that's the end. Uh, wow, 850, uh, 8.59. We did good tonight, and me and Kaz again, so I'm going to get rid of that. So there's so much more to say as you know, um, and we'll get to all that. We'll get to all that um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but at least we kind of dug in a little bit. I had another couple hundred photos on my phone and it's obviously too much for tonight. So I'm going to I'm gonna work over the weekend on um, translating as many of these rugs as I can into line drawings that will be available as patterns in the ribbon candy hooking store. And you know that as soon as I can, and it will be soon, I will, it will have to be soon, I'm going to get in the habit of going out there and talking to her more and looking at more pieces and hearing stories and um, just getting it all nailed down. You know, I have this feeling that the bandstand is starting soon and I have this blanket and I'm afraid it's going to blow away. That's not a metaphor. And I want to put my rocks on the corner and I just have to do it soon. Um, 
also while I'm super excited and passionate about this project. So there's a lot more to come on this subject, and, and um, you know I'll, I'll gather it as quickly as I can. It was wonderful. It was wonderful being with everybody tonight. Maybe you could recreate the rug with just the borders um, all the way to the center. I was thinking that, too, with the borders and the compartments, and then people could plug in different buildings, different animals, different people, whatever they wanted in the center. That would be a super great um, idea because in terms of composition, it's a, it's a very strong composition. Um, her story is the church's, but somebody else's stories might not be. So interesting. Um, Karen, you are so welcome. And, you know, how can it not be inspired when we're, what we're looking at, to, you know, I mean, it's just, it's so much good work in one place. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you on Monday. I don't know what we're doing, but we will do something great on Monday. We'll probably start looking at the rugs from the Hooked in the Mountains, uh, Green Mountain, you know, where I was yesterday with Kaz. We'll probably start looking at that rug show. Um, and start digging it. We'll certainly be looking at the circus rugs that I bought, right? We have got to look at those immediately. So we're going to have a great week next week, um, and it's going to be a busy week because I took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures at that too, and uh, and they were happy with me, uh, anybody taking pictures, as long as you attribute them. So I will be attributing them like crazy as we go through the show and we look at the different slides. I guess that's what we're up to next week. Although my rug cooking magazine came in the mail today, did yours? As soon as I saw it and I saw that beautiful candle on the front cover, I've seen that before. That is one of my favorite rugs of all time, that candle with the kind of color wheel of light around it. I will next week, I'll have to decide what day, we'll look at Rug Cooking Magazine together and see what the feature articles are. But otherwise, we'll be looking at the Hooked in the Mountains show for sure. And you are so welcome. Everybody, you are so welcome. Fantastic. We can catch up over the weekend. And if you need me in the meantime, um, you can find me at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you, and otherwise I will see you Monday at noon Eastern Central Time for Coffee Time.